Welcome to summon a long time requested video, the number 9 in the Norse beliefs. It pops up all over Norse mythology as most of you have noticed, uh, but it also comes up in the much later on folk tradition, all the way up until the 18 and even 1900s reflecting some pagan continued traditions after all that time. It's also found in many other spiritual traditions around the world, and there is a very special reason for all of this, so we are going over all of these sources in this video and some of the interpretations on the number 9 and why it is so sacred. So first, there's a great scholarly article on all this. I'll put a link to that down below. Uh, there are other sources um, that go over the number nine uh, from later on, uh, and I'll put those uh, books in the video in the link in the description below too. Uh, but this uh, paper is the most complete bit of research from the Norse sources, at least, that I have found on the number nine. Um, so first of all, uh, we have to speak about the nine worlds. This is the most known attestation of the number nine from Norse mythology. I'm not going to go and do uh, much detail on that because I did a full video on it here a while back with all the sources and explanations that you can check out. But essentially, it says in multiple sources from the Viking Age that there are, in fact, nine worlds or nine realms, but it doesn't give the names of all those realms, so we can only make a guess as to what most of them uh, were. Uh, for me and others, those are clearly different uh, dimensions, different realms, um, and this kind of aligns with something called string theory and physics how there are you know anywhere from 10 to 12 uh, or even more dimensions uh, take that and minus the three dimensions that we humans can perceive with our eyes and, and that could very well add up to being nine total just like in the uh, North beliefs and many spiritualities around the world believe that there are you know nine dimensions or different realms uh, so uh, it is also worth noting that there are also in the heavenly uh, realm there is nine parts to that heavenly realm um, so the certain part of a, a heavenly realm there are nine parts to it there are also in the uh, realm of hell the afterlife um, in the realm of the dead in the Norse beliefs there are nine rivers and they are named uh, here um, so those are just a few uh, notes that there could be you know uh, believed to be nine parts of nine realms and all those different things and the important different dimensions and afterlives and all that whatever you would like to believe uh, next we can speak about nine days nine days comes up a lot in the Norse sources um, Odin hung on a tree for nine uh, nights when he learned the sacred knowledge of the runes and, and the 18 magic songs, by the way, and that is in uh, Havamal. Uh, this is interpreted to be some sort of shamanic type ritual that humans actually did a journey into other realms. Um, same thing uh, in the myth when Hermodr travels to Hel to retrieve Baldr after he dies, and Hermodr travels on Schleipnir. It, Odin's horse for nine nights in complete darkness and that's uh, told in the prose Edda again that is some sort of underworld journey very similar to what eastern shamanic um, uh, traditional practices do and by the way Schleipnir who is the eight-legged horse of Odin and eight-legged horse is also depicted in various eastern shamanic uh, traditions as the carrier of the soul um, to other realms this is what Schleipnir's name means it means the slippery one or the sliding one. It's the force that carries our soul slipping and sliding in and out of our body. As is the tree of life, by the way, Yggdrasil. Um, that Yggdrasil um, literally means a horse of Ygir. Ygir is another name for Odin. So I've done videos on all these things with uh, more detailed uh, explanation. But yeah, the symbolism in those myths is pretty easy to understand. Uh, in certain, you know, rituals where we can send our soul into the outer realms or other worlds or underworld, whatever, uh, nine days seems to be the magic number to achieve optimum success, at least in the Norse beliefs. Uh, also, the magic ring Draupnir in the Norse mythology, every nine nights drips um, 
eight new rings from it. Uh, I did a video on Drepne too. Um, this is symbolic of the eight parts to our soul and how they develop during the pregnancy term, as is uh, most of the other items that the gods are gifted from the dwarves early on in the mythology. Again, I've done videos on all that, and that is actually similar to Greek and old Vedic belief that we have eight parts to our soul. Uh, so somehow, some way, every nine days during the uh, pregnancy, or perhaps it could be symbolic of nine months, as is uh, sometimes theorized as well, uh, that that is when uh, we get our full soul. That is when Drepnir drips the full uh, 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 parts of our soul there. Uh, the obvious connection to the number nine, though, that most uh, of, that, that some scholars have drawn attention to is the nine months of uh, pregnancy. That's not quite right. Okay, we, we know pregnancy can be clo a bit closer to ten months, um, but usually it is it comes in nine moon cycles, which is why it's called nine months usually in the Norse myth that can relate to that. Um, uh, another one about that, uh, Freyr had to wait nine nights uh, in order to get married to Gerdir in the poem Skirnismal. This myth is symbolic of the seed being planted in the land, like the uh, uh, yard or the farmland or the enclosed agricultural land, which is essentially what Gerdir's name comes from. And Freyr, or Frö, as, as he is sometimes called, uh, his name originates from the word for seed or like fertile or fusen or i forget the what the exact word is but yeah the etymology is all here up on the thing so guys i'm going i'm going over these uh, theories quickly uh, and for the sake of the video no need to get offended if, if you haven't read sources about these uh, theories elsewhere yet you will come across them eventually when you do more studying welcome to norse mythology i've done videos with all those sources and in-depth explanations on all of that if you're interested in learning more, but I'm I'm not uh, going to go over all of these explanations in detail in this video. I'm just summarizing because this is the focus on something else. Another one, when uh, the uh, goddess Skadi and Njord were married, they spent nine nights with each other and um, the, in each of their home places at the sea for Njord versus the mountains for uh, Skadi. And then they eventually decided they could not live with each other. That myth, I don't know. I haven't read any theories on it and what it means and I have no interpretations that I've come up with myself. So if you guys do, uh, please let us know down below in the comments. We can all share and figure out the lost beliefs of our people. Uh, another one in the Völsunga saga, uh, Sinfjotli had nine brothers and when they were captured, now one of them was devoured by a she-wolf one was devoured each for nine nights in total. And that number nine comes up uh, a few times in reference to wolves in the Völsunga saga, and especially the Helgi Lay poems in the Poetic Edda as well. And there seems to be some sort of vague connection between the number nine and wolves, especially these rituals where men can become wolves. Ulfhednar, the wolf warriors. We even see this in old Greek beliefs, where one represents of one uh, family or kin of, from each generation had to become a wolf uh, for nine years as told by Pliny the Elder a later on source but he was telling about an ancient uh, old Greek custom so possibly there is an underworld journey involving berserkers and Ulfhednar, the wolf warriors of the Viking Age, and as some other uh, sources suggest. Again, I've done lots of videos on berserkers and Ulfhednar and all those rituals. Uh, now let's speak about nine years, because this comes up in Norse mythology uh, sometimes, along with other sources too, in Völundarkvida. There were three Valkyries that had swan pelts, and then three brothers took them away uh, and forced the Valkyries to marry them. After nine years, the Valkyries regained their swan pelts, and they were able to fly away. Uh, and another myth from Grotasanger, um, the giantess Menya and uh, Fenja uh, lived underground for nine years. 
Uh, another cool one, very cool, in a couple sources, the age of nine seems to be um, uh, some sort of transition to adulthood and responsibility. A child past the age of nine was permitted to make their own decisions, to a certain extent, of course. Um, uh, this is depicted in Vattensdada Saga and Heimskringla Sigurd Saga. Uh, so there are no sources on these or what the nine years is all about, but it seems to me, at least, when I read those uh, sources and, and, and interpret them, uh, it has to do with the rebirth. Uh, the Greeks, too, they believed, as I will cover a bit later on in the video, nine years was the time where the best, most honorable souls would ideally be reincarnated, reborn. Um, and it seems like at the age of nine, there was a rebirth for a child realizing its true self as you were meant to be. And perhaps this is, this is what that means, um, that the uh, uh, lives come in cycles of nine, uh, nine years, and when big changes and rebirths happen, uh, that's just me though, my interpretation, let me know what you guys think. Um, we can get on to sacrifices, because nine years is spoken about in some of these uh, sources as well, and these are... Uh, these are real-life first or second-hand accounts that we have about this, whereas the sources that I have went over up until now were mostly mythological, and of course they're symbolic, and we know that. Um, but now we see how the number nine in this time frame translates into real life, too. Uh, Adam of Bremen's uh, account of the temple at uh, Uppsala in Sweden in the late Viking Age, he says that there were nine days of sacrifices where each day a male from a different species would be sacrificed and there'd be nine sacrifices in total. There was also, according to Theotma of Merseburg, again, a very reliable historical source, there was a sacrifice at Leire at the temple in Denmark in the Viking Age where every nine years, nine of each species would be sacrificed, including men. Um, in the Inglinga saga, uh, there was a tale about a Swedish king named Un. He was 60 years old and sacrificed a new son to Odin to live another 10 years. And he did this nine times. He sacrificed nine of his sons and he lived to be over 150 years old apparently. Uh, but he eventually died because his people wouldn't let him sacrifice a 10th son. Okay, that source is probably not as reliable. But at least the source that that is in, the Heimskringla, it's in general been confirmed to be a relatively reliable source, most parts of it at least. Uh, so going back to some of the more early mythological sources, um, um, but it, it also tales based on real events, but of course they were made into like legendary tales over time. The Helgeles, um, the poems uh, there are a perfect example, also Völsunga Saga. In there, um, nine Valkyries show up to visit Helgi, which basically, you know, they, they give him a kick in the ass to stop being lazy, and then he gets uh, turned into his full potential and becomes what he was supposed to become. Uh, later in the story... Um, uh, three times nine Valkyries, so 27, were, uh, were protecting Helgi's fleet in a battle. In the same cycle of semi-mythological legendary poems where Helgi and his Valkyrie lover are reincarnated, uh, the Valkyrie Sigrun um, shows up with her uh, nine other Valkyries to calm a storm that Helgi is sailing in. And there are sources too when uh, uh, Valkyries show up in groups of nine or multiples of nine. So it could be 18, 27 or so on. Uh, there are also, um, we can speak about the Norns, there are only three Norns, which most of you know, but in one source, Snoji mentions that there are nine Norns total, three sets of three. Three for the Asir, which we all know, but there are also three for the race of Elves, and three for the Dwarves, so nine Norns in total, according to, um, Fafnismal and Gilfagini, and there are a lot more sources ranging from kind of full-on uh, mythological sources to actually quite credible sources that detail real events, and those refer to nine as well, specifically nine maidens. Uh, Heimdall, for example, is the son of nine sisters. 
Uh, at the god Agir has nine daughters with his wife Jan, and they are both personifications of the sea, symbolic of the sea, and their daughters are named after the different types of waves. Uh, we have uh, Mengled, she has nine uh, maid servants. Um, in a source on Saider, uh, the practitioner, a, a woman here, th this is in Saga of Eric the Red, about the discovery of uh, Greenland, uh, a woman named Tuibjörg was uh, said to have nine sisters and they were all uh, prophetic. Um, so lots of uh, groups of nine when it comes to like special maidens or things like that. Uh, it also comes up in uh, uh, myths about the Filgia. One of them was uh, one tale about the uh, Disablut, a man who was named Thidrandi, is killed by nine women uh, when he was ho hosting a feast. And they knocked at the door and he went out and he was killed by them. It turns out that they were not real women, but they were actually the Filgia of the guests at the party. And they killed him because they were pissed off that Christianity was coming to Iceland. Uh, okay, that sounds like a fairy tale too. But in this source, it's the saga of Olav Tryggvason in the Flatere book. And that is regarded as a very reliable source of real events otherwise. So you don't have to believe it, um, but we can say at the very least that it was believed at the time. Uh, some final mythological notes. After uh, Thor kills the Midgardsoim at Ragnarok, Thor is poisoned by its venom and is able to take nine steps until he falls dead. Uh, that is a famous one. I've not figured out what that nine steps means, but it's important to note sometimes these things are not symbolic um, and they don't have deep meaning sometimes it's just a number that they chose when they were writing the myth or the source or whatever when they had no other option they had just to be creative and put something in there it was a very important number in pagan belief the number nine and they would have added it to all kinds of stories even when there was no real point to it it was just a you know preferred number that fits well in their culture so what happened was um, Post-Christianization, so we're talking the, you know, uh, the official end of pagan times and the uh, uh, 1000s. What happened was a lot of the times uh, 9 turned into the number 7, the sacred Christian number. But sometimes, even long, long after pagan times, the number 9 continued even when the Christians could have easily just switched it out with the number 7. So when we see uh, instances like that, with almost uh, complete certainty, um, we can hear the number 9 traditions long after pagan times, and it means that that particular practice or tradition may have much older pagan roots. And that's what the things we are going over here. First, just a couple hundred years after the Christianization of Scandinavia, the Grogos law codes and also the Gulathing law code uh, in Norway uh, refer to uh, nine many times in this, in a legal setting. For example, there were nine elected leaders of certain regions in Iceland. There were nine different types of assault. Um, in a court setting for certain crimes, there should be nine witnesses. For example, when uh, a, a corpse was being transported, um, a murdered victim, they needed nine people to uh, witness it to make sure there was no funny business going on. Uh, so a lot of these laws in the Gyrogos and Gula thing and all these other law codes, um, they uh, actually uh, forbid pagan practices. Uh, you can see my video on all of those pagan practices they forbid here. But a lot of the laws in that same code were a direct continuation of pagan law. They didn't just throw away everything pagan and adopt a whole new Christian law in the year 1066, like many people suggest. So pagan belief and custom absolutely continued in many parts, although some pagan belief and custom were outlawed. Uh, now I'm going to go... Um, over a few of the folk traditions involving the number 9-2. And guys, there are hundreds of these. They are from the black books, the grimoires. Some of them are from like old witch trials that were recorded, magic books that were preserved, local legends, county records all over Scandinavia. The best books in English where you can read more is uh, Trildom and also Scandinavian Folk Belief and Legend. Uh, I'm just going over a few of the examples here. 
uh, one practice that was done in Sweden as late as the 1800s uh, to cure a toothache. You could get a twig from nine different uh, fruit-bearing trees, and you could pick the tooth that was aching, and then you put the twigs away and bury them in an anthill that was north of the farm. Uh, from the same time period, Sweden in the 1800s, to cure what was called a trill shot, which is like a curse like that was shot at someone like with a projectile, uh, you could go to a willow tree and take nine small branches from that willow tree and make them into a ring uh, like this. And on the morning before a sun rises, you take those rings and make downward strokes on the person who was affected by that uh, trill shot. That doesn't sound like something very Christian. Another one from the 1700s in Sweden, uh, a love spell actually. Um, uh, you take nine drops of water from a river or a creek uh, where there was a whirlpool going and you take those drops and you sprinkle it and then rub it in on the one that you uh, love and then they will be in love with you in return. Another one, as late as the 1900s, we have records of this being practiced, to get rid of longing. If you miss someone or miss something, you could take nine pieces of bread, uh, drop it down your clothes uh, from the neck and all the way down and coming out through the ankle and you would be cured of your longing. Uh, these are just a few guys I could go on all day. And if you guys know the uh, Vaidruna song in the last album, there's the song called Ni. And that whole song, its lyrics is about this exact kind of thing. Different folk traditions involving the number nine. And they are found all over Scandinavia. Uh, like I said, as recent as a hundred years ago. And as old as, you know, a thousand years ago. And like I say all the time, I don't care when they were first recorded. If it is recorded late on and it's clearly not a Christian thing and there are pagan traces to it, then guess what? It's pagan. I don't care when it was first recorded. It's a very good chance that this was an ancient tradition going back long before it was first recorded and long before the Viking Age even. So that's all I have to say for today. Um, I only went over a small percent of when the number nine is mentioned in all the Norse sources. If you read any Viking Age saga, even extending beyond that to foreign Christian sources about the Norsemen or other pagan Germanic peoples, the number nine comes up all the time. A lot of it, remember, it's just a number and has no symbolic meaning a, a large portion of the time. And of course, other times it is very symbolic and it was specifically chosen uh, because nature come the nines and you know the number nine is nothing unique to the norse in vedic sanskrit texts an important number is nine um one of the most famous ones um is the uh, uh 12 sets of nine which is uh, 108 um and, and that's in buddhism and other eastern spirituality there are these mantras that are supposed to be chanted 108 times in greek mythology nine is probably mentioned more than all other cultures, and the Greek mentions of the number nine is probably mentioned um, uh, only second to the Norse uh, sources, but many times, uh, probably the most famous is Persephone, who every nine years would restore souls for the sun. Um, uh, 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 especially kings and honorable people who had given compensation in their previous lives. So ideally, in a perfect situation, um, uh, the Greeks believed that they could be reincarnated every nine years, as there are some similar uh, sources uh, of that in the Norse um, texts. Uh, also, according to Pythagoras, uh, man was a chord consisting of eight different sounds, and uh, you can see the similarity there to the uh, Norse Drepnir with the eight rings. And in the Greek beliefs, it was eight chords, and the the um, the deity was what 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 the person connected to was uh, composed of the ninth one. Uh, there are also nine muses in Greek mythology. Those those are closely related to the Valkyries, of course. Uh, in ancient Egypt, there are nine Ennead gods. Uh, all of these here that you see in ancient Hittite religion, there is a nine-year sacrifice and a story about the generations of gods and so so much more like i said there's a great academic paper about all of this that you can find in the link below but hope that helps um and uh yeah there's this was a question for a long time and hope uh hope that cleared up some things truth is the number nine is you know the nine can be symbolic of many different things 
and it can be symbolic of nothing. So that's uh, it all depends on the source and uh, and what you're reading and what you want to believe. But that's all for today. Hope that helped. Vi ses nästa gång.